Chapter 31 Clean Men Next morning, Stella accosted Flask. Such a queer dream, King Post, I never had. You know the old man's ivory leg. While I dreamed, he kicked me with it. And when I tried to kick back upon my soul, my little man, I kicked my leg right off. And then presto, Ahab seemed a pyramid. And I, like a blazing fool, kept kicking at it. But what was still more curious, Flask, you know how curious all dreams are. Through all this rage that I was in, I somehow seemed to be thinking to myself that after all it was not much of an insult, that kick from Ahab. Why, thinks I, what's the row? It's not a real leg, only a false leg. And there's a mighty difference between a living thump and a dead thump. That's what makes a blow from the hand flask fifty times more savage to bear than a blow from a cane. The living member, that makes the living insult, my little man. And thinks I to myself all the while mind while I was stubbing my silly toes against that cursed pyramid. So confoundedly contradictory was it all. All the while I say I was thinking to myself, what's his leg now but a cane? A whalebone cane. Yes, thinks I, it was only a playful cudgeling. In fact, only a whale boning that he gave me, not a base kick. Besides, thinks I, look at it once. By the end of it, the foot part, what a small sort of end it is. Whereas if a broad-footed farmer kicked me, there's a devilish broad insult. But this insult is whittled down to a point only. But now comes the greatest joke of the dream flask. While I was battering away at the pyramid, a sort of badger-haired old merman with a hump on his back takes me by the shoulders and slews me round. What are you about, he said. Slid, my man, but I was frightened. Such a fizz. But somehow next moment I was over the fright. What am I about, says I at last. And what business is that of yours, I should like to know, Mr. Humpback? Do you want a kick? By the Lord Flask, I had no sooner said that than he turned round his stern to me, bent over and dragging up a lot of seaweed he had for a clout. What do you think I saw? Why, thunder alive, man, his stern was stuck full of marlin spikes with the points out. Says I on second thoughts, I guess I won't kick you. You old fellow. Wise stub, said he, wise stub, and kept muttering it all the time, a sort of eating of his own gums like a chimney hag. Since he wasn't going to stop saying over them his wise stub, wise stub, I thought I might as well fall to kicking the pyramid again. But I had only just lifted my leg for it when he roared out, Stop that kicking. Hello, says I. What's the matter now, old fellow? Look ye here, says he. Let's argue the insult. Captain Ahab kicked you, didn't he? Yes, he did, says I. Right here it was. Very good, says he. He used his ivory leg, didn't he? Yes, he did, says I. Well then, says he. Why, Stub, what have ye to complain of? Didn't he kick with the right good will? It wasn't a common pitch pine leg he kicked with, was it? No, you were kicked by a great man and with a beautiful ivory leg, Stub. It's an honor. I consider it an honor. Listen, wise Stub. In old England, the greatest lords think it great glory to be slapped by a queen and made garter knights of. But be your boast, Stub, that ye were kicked by old Ahab and made a wise man of. Remember what I say be kicked by him, account his kicks honors, and on no account kick back, for you can't help yourself, wise stub. Don't you see that pyramid? With that, he all of a sudden seems somehow, in some queer fashion, to swim off into the air. I snored, rolled over, and there I was in my hammock. Now what do you think of that dream, Flask? I don't know. It seems a sort of foolish to me, though. Maybe, maybe. 
but it's made a wise man of me, Flask. Do you see Ahab standing there, sideways, looking over the stern? Well, the best thing you can do, Flask, is to let that old man alone. Never speak quick to him, whatever he says. Halloa. Uh, what's that, he shouts? Hark. Masthead, there. Look sharp, all of ye. There are whales hereabouts. If you see a white one, split your lungs for him. What do you think of that now, Flask? Ain't there a small drop of something queer about that, eh? A white whale. Did you mark that, man? Look ye. There's something special in the wind. Stand by for it, Flask. Ahab has that. That's bloody on his mind. But, Mum, he comes this way. Chapter 32. Cetology. Already we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unshored, harborless immensities. Ere that come to pass, ere the Pequod's weedy hull roll side by side with the barnacled hulls of the Leviathan. At the outset, it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough appreciative understanding of the more spe special Leviathanic revelations and illusions of all sorts which are to follow. It is some systematized exhibition of the whale in his broad genera that I would now fain put before you. Yet is it no easy task. The classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less is here essayed. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. No branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cytology, says Captain Scoresby, A.D. 1820. It is not my intention, nor it in my power, to enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetacea into groups and families. Utter confusion exists among the historians of this animal, sperm whale, says Sergeant Peel. A.D. 1839. Unfitness to pursue our research in the unfathomable waters. Impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the cetacea. A field strewn with thorns. All these incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists. Thus speak of the whale of the great Cuvier and John Hunter and Lesson those lights of zoology and anatomy. Nevertheless, though of real knowledge there be little, yet of books there are a plenty. And so in some small degree with cetology, or the science of whales, many are the men, small and great, old and new, landsmen and seamen, who have at large or in little written of the whale. Run over a few, the authors of the Bible, Aristotle, Pliny, Aldrovandi, Sir Thomas Brown, Gessner, Ray, Linnaeus, Rondeletius, Willoughby, Green, Artady, Sibold, Brisson, Arton, Lesepade, Bonneter, Desmarest, Baron Cuvier, Frederick Cuvier, John Hunter, Owen, Scoresby, Field, Bennett, J. Ross Brown, the author of Miriam Coffin, Olmsted, and the Reverend T. Cheever. But to what ultimate generalizing purpose all these have written, the above cited extracts will show. Of the names in this list of whale authors, only those following Owen ever saw living whales. But one of them was a real professional harpooner and whaler. I mean Captain Scoresby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority. But Scoresby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale, compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. And here be it said that the Greenland whale is a usurper upon the throne of the seas. 
He is not even by any means the largest of the whales. Yet owing to the long priority of his claims, and the profound ignorance, which till some seventy years back, invested the then fabulous or utterly unknown sperm whale, and which ignorance to this present day still reigns in all but some few scientific retreats and whale ports. This usurpation has been every way complete. Reference to nearly all the leviathanic allusions in the great poets of past days will satisfy you that the Greenland whale, without one rival, was to them the monarch of the seas. But the time has at last come for a new proclamation. This is jarring cross, hear ye. Good people all, the Greenland whale is deposed. The great sperm whale now reigneth. There are only two books in being which I all pretend to put the living sperm whale before you. And at the same time, in the remotest degree, succeed in the attempt. Those books are Beals and Bents both in their time surgeons to English South Sea whale ships, and both exact and reliable men. The original matter touching the sperm whale to be found in their volumes is necessarily small, but so far as it goes, it is of excellent quality, though mostly confined to scientific description. As yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, is not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. Now, the various species of whales need some sort of popular comprehensive classification, if only an easy outline, one for the present, hereafter to be filled in all its departments by subsequent laborers. As no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my own poor endeavors. I promise nothing complete, because any human thing supposed to be complete must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. I shall not pretend a minute anatomical description of the various species, or in this place at least, to much of any description. My object here is simply to project the draft of a systematization of cytology. I am the architect, not the builder. But it is a ponderous task. No ordinary letter sorter in the post office is equal to it. To grope down into the bottom of the sea after them, to have one's hands among the unspeakable foundations, ribs and very pelvis of the world, this is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this leviathan? The awful tauntings in Job might well appall me. Will he, the leviathan, make a covenant with thee? Behold, the hope of him is vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans. I have had to do with whales with these visible hands. I am in earnest, and I will try. There are some preliminaries to settle. First, the uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cytology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a whale be a fish. In his System of Nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, I hereby separate the whales from the fish. But of my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, alewives and herring, against Linnaeus's express edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The grounds upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows. On account of their warm bilocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, penum intrantum, feminam, mammis lactantum, and finally, ex lege naturae jure meritoc. I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin of Nantucket, 
both messmates of mine in a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. Be it known that, leaving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish, and call upon holy Jonah to back me. This fundamental thing settled, the next point is, in what internal ass respect does the whale differ from other fish? Above, Linnaeus has given you those items, but in brief they are these, lungs and warm blood, whereas all other fish are lungless and cold-blooded. Next, how shall we define the whale? by his obvious externals, so as conspicuously to label him for all time to come. To be short, then, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have it. However contracted, that definition is the result of expanded meditation. A walrus spouts much like the whale, but the walrus is not a fish, because he is amphibious. But the last term of the definition is still more cogent, as coupled with the first. Almost anyone must have noticed that all the fish familiar to landsmen have not a flat, but a vertical, or up and down, tail. Whereas among spouting fish, the tail, though it may be similarly shaped, invariably assumes a horizontal position. By the above definition of what a whale is, I do by no means exclude from the Leviathanic Brotherhood any sea creature hitherto identified with the whale by the best informed Nantucketers, nor, on the other hand, link it with any fish hitherto authoritatively regarded as alien. Hence, all the smaller spouting and horizontal tailed fish must be included in this ground plan of cetology. How then? come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. First, according to magnitude, I divide the whales into three primary books, subdivisible into chapters, and these shall comprehend them all, both small and large. One, the folio whale. Two, the octavo whale. Three, the duodecimo whale. As the type of the folio, I present the sperm whale, of the octavo, the grampus, of the duodecimo, the porpoise. Folios. Among these I here include the following chapters. 1. The sperm whale. 2. The right whale. 3. The finback whale. 4. The humpbacked whale. 5. The razorback whale. 6. The sulfur bottom whale. Book 1, Folio. Chapter 1, Sperm Whale. This whale, among the English of old vaguely known as the Trumpa Whale, and the Facetter Whale, and the Anvil-Headed Whale, is the present Cachalot of the French, and the Potfish of the Germans, and the Macrocephalus of the Long Words. He is, without doubt, the largest inhabitant of the globe the most formidable of all whales to encounter, the most majestic in aspect. And lastly, by far the most, in, most valuable in commerce, he being the only creature from which that valuable substance, spermaceti, is obtained. All his peculiarities well, in many other places, be enlarged upon. It is chiefly with his name that I now have to do. Philologically considered, it is absurd. Some centuries ago, when the sperm whale was almost wholly unknown as his own proper individuality, and when his oil was only accidentally obtained from the stranded fish, in those days spermaceti, it would seem, was popularly supposed to be derived from a creature identical with the one then known in England as the Greenland or right whale. It was the idea also that this same spermaceti was that quickening humor of the Greenland whale, which the first syllable of the word literally expresses. 
In those times, also, spermaceti was exceedingly scarce, not being used for light, but only as an ointment and medicament. It was only to be had from the druggists, as you nowadays buy an ounce of rhubarb. When, as I opine in the course of time, the true nature of spermaceti became known, its original name was still retained by the dealers. No doubt, to enhance its value, by a notion so strangely significant of its scarcity. So the appellation must at last have come to be bestowed upon the whale, from which this spermaceti was really derived. Book one, Fulmer, chapter two, Nightmare. With one respect, this is the most venerable of the leviathans, being the one first regularly hunted by man. It yields the article commonly known as whalebone or baleen, and the oil specially known as whale oil, an inferior article in commerce. Among the fishermen, it is indiscriminately designated by all the following titles. The whale, the Greenland whale, the black whale, the great whale, the true whale, the right whale. There is a deal of obscurity concerning the identity of the species thus multitudinously baptized. What then is the whale, which I include in the second species of my folios? It is the great mysticitus of the English naturalists, the Greenland whale of the English whalemen, the baleen ordinaire of the French whalemen, the Grandlands volfisk of the Swedes. It is the whale which for more than two centuries past has been hunted by the Dutch and English in the Arctic seas. It is the whale which the American fishermen have long pursued in the Indian Ocean, on the Brazil banks, on the Norwest coast, and various other parts of the world, designated by them right whale cruising grounds. Some pretend to see a difference between the Greenland whale of the English and the right whale of the Americans, but they precisely agree in all their grand features, nor has there yet been presented a single determinate fact upon which to ground a radical distinction. It is by endless subdivisions based upon the most inconclusive differences that some departments of natural history become so repellingly intricate. The right whale will be elsewhere treated of at some length, with reference to elucidating the sperm whale. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 3, Finback. Under this head, I reckon a monster which, by the various names of Finback, Tall Spout, and Long John, has been sent, seen almost in every sea, and is commonly the whale, whose distant jet is so often described by passengers crossing the Atlantic. In the New York packet tracts, in the length he attains, and in his baleen, the finback resembles the right whale, but is of a less portly girth and a lighter color, approaching to olive. His great lips present a cable-like aspect, formed by the intertwisting, slanting folds of large wrinkles. His grand distinguishing feature, the fin from which he derives his name, is often a conspicuous object. This fin is some three or four feet long, growing vertically from the hinder part of the back on an angular shape, and with a very sharp pointed end. Even if not the slightest other part of the creature be visible, this isolated fin will at times be seen plainly projecting from the surface. When the sea is moderately calm and slightly marked with spherical ripples, and this gnomon-like fin stands up and casts shadows upon the wrinkled surface, it may well be supposed that the watery circle surrounding it somewhat resembles a dial, with its style and wavy hour lines engraved on it. On that Ahaz dial, the shadow often goes back. The fin pack is not gregarious. He seems a whale-hater, as some men are man-haters very shy, always going solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters, his straight and single lofty jet rising like a tall misanthropic spear upon a barren plain, gifted with such wondrous power and velocity and swimming as to defy all purpose.
present pursuit from man. This Leviathan seems the banished and unconquerable king of his race, bearing for his mark that style upon his back. From having the baleen in his mouth, the finback is sometimes included with the right whale among a theoretic species denominated whalebone whales, that is, whales with baleen. Of the so whalebone whales, there would be seen to be several varieties, most of which, however, are little known. Broad-nosed whales and beaked whales, pike-headed whales, bunched whales, underjawed whales, and rostrated whales are the fishermen's names for a few sorts. In connection with this appellative of whalebone whales, it is of great importance to mention that however such a nomenclature may be convenient in facilitating allusions to some kind of whales, yet it is in vain to attempt a clear classification of the leviathan founded upon either his baleen or hump or fin or teeth. Notwithstanding that those marked parts or features very obviously seem better adapted to afford the basis for a regular system of cetology than any other detached bodily distinctions, which the whale in his kinds presents. How then? The baleen, hump, back fin, and teeth. These are things whose peculiarities are indiscriminately dispersed among all sorts of whales, without any regard to what may be the nature of their structure and other and more essential particulars. Thus, the sperm whale and the humpbacked whale each has a hump, but there the similitude ceases. Then the same humpbacked whale and the Greenland whale, each of, has, each of these has baleen, but there again the similitude ceases. And it is just the same with the other parts above mentioned. In various sorts of whales, they form such irregular combinations, or in the case of any one of them detached, such an irregular isolation, as utterly to defy all general methodization formed upon such a basis. On this rock, every one of the whale naturalists has split. But it may be possibly conceived that, in the internal parts of the whale, in his anatomy, there at least we shall be able to hit the right classification. Nay, what thing, for example, is there in the Greenland whale's anatomy more striking than his baleen? Yet we have seen that by his baleen, it is impossibly possible correctly to classify the Greenland whale. And if you descend into the bowels of the various leviathans, by there you will not find distinctions a fiftieth part as available to the systematizer as those external ones already enumerated. What then remains? Nothing but to take hold of the whales bodily, in their entire liberal volume, and boldly sort them that way. And this is the bibliographical system here adopted, and it is the only one that can possibly succeed, for it alone is practicable. To proceed. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 4, Humpback. This whale is often seen on the northern American coast. He has been frequently captured there and towed into harbor. He has a great pack on him like a peddler, or you might call him the elephant and castle whale. At any rate, the popular name for him does not sufficiently distinguish him, since the sperm whale also has a hump, though a smaller one. His oil is not very valuable. He has baleen, he is the most gamesome and light-hearted of all the whales, making more gay foam and white water generally than any other of them. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 5, Razorback. Of this whale, little is known but his name. I have seen him at a distance off Cape Horn. Of a retiring nature, he eludes both hunters and philosophers. Though no coward, he has not yet shown any part of him but his back, which rises in a long, sharp ridge. Let him go. I know little more of him, nor does anybody else. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 6, Sulphur Bottom. Another retiring gentleman with a brim 
Tombstone Gully. Doubtless got by scraping along the Tartarian tiles and some of his profounder divings. He is seldom seen, at least I have never seen him, except in the remoter southern seas, yet always at too great a distance to study his countenance. He is never chased. He would run away with rope walks of line. Prodigies are told of him. Adieu, sulfur bottom. I can say nothing more that is true of ye, nor can the oldest Nantucketer. Thus ends book one, folio, and now begins book two, octavo. Octavos. These embrace the whales of middling magnitude, among which at present may be numbered one, the grampus, two, the blackfish, three, the narwhal, four, the thrasher, five, the killer. Book two, Octavo, chapter one, Grampus. Though this fish, whose loud, sonorous breathing, or rather blowing, has furnished a proverb to landsmen, is so well known a denizen of the deep, yet is he not popularly classed among whales. But possessing all the grand distinctive features of the leviathan, most naturalists have recognized him for one. He is of moderate octavo size, varying from 15 to 25 feet in length, and of corresponding dimensions round the waist. He swims in herds, he is never regularly hunted, though his oil is considerable in quantity and pretty good for light. By some fishermen his approach is regarded as premonite, Premonitory, premonitory of the advance of the great sperm whale. Book two, Octavo, Chapter two, Blackfish. I give the popular fishermen's names for all these fish, for generally they are the best. Where any name happens to be vague or inexpressive, I shall say so and suggest another. I do so now the blackfish so-called because blackness is the rule among almost all whales. So call him the hyena whale if you please. His veracity is well known and from the circumstance that the inner angles of his lips are curved upwards, he carries an everlasting Mephistophelian grin on his face. This whale averages some 16 or 18 feet in length. He is found in almost all latitudes. He has a peculiar way of showing his dorsal hooked fin in swimming, which looks something like a Roman nose. When not more profitably employed, the sperm whale hunters sometimes capture the hyena whale to keep up the supply of cheap oil for domestic employment, as some frugal housekeepers in the absence of company quite alone by themselves burn unsavory tallow instead of odorous wax. Though their blubber is very thin, some of these whales will yield you upwards of 30 gallons of oil. Book 2, Octavo, Chapter 3, Narwhale, that is, Nostril Whale. Another instance of a curiously named whale, so named, I suppose, his peculiar horn being originally mistaken for a peaked nose. The creature is some 16 feet in length, while its horn averages 5 feet, though some exceed 10, and even attain to 15 feet. Strictly speaking, this horn is but a lengthened tusk, growing out from the jaw in a line a little depressed from the horizontal. But it is only found on the sinister side, which has an ill effect, giving its owner something analogous to the aspect of a clumsy left-handed man. What precise purpose this ivory horn or lance answers, it would be hard to say. It does not seem to be used like the blade of the swordfish and billfish, 
though some sailors tell me that Narwhale employs it for a rake in turning over the bottom of the sea for food. Charlie Coffin said it was used for an ice piercer for the narwhal, rising to the surface of the polar sea and finding it sheeted with ice, thrusts his horn up and so breaks through. But you cannot prove either of these surmises to be correct. My own opinion is that however this one-sided horn may really be used by the narwhal, however that it may be, it would certainly be convenient to him for a folder in reading pamphlets. The narwhal I have heard called the tusked whale, the horned whale, and the unicorn whale. He is certainly a curious example of the unicornism to be found in almost every kingdom of animated nature. From certain cloistered old authors, I have gathered that this same sea unicorn's horn was in ancient days regarded as the great antidote against poison, and as such, preparations of it brought immense prices. It was also distilled to a volatile of salts for fainting ladies, the same way that the horns of the male deer are manufactured into heart's horn. Originally, it was in, in itself a competent object of great curiosity. Blackletter tells me that Sir Martin Frobisher, on his return from that voyage, when Queen Bess did gallantly wave her jeweled hand to him from a window of Greenwich Palace, as his bold ship sailed down the Thames, when Sir Martin returned from that voyage, saith Blackletter, on bended knees he presented to her highness a prodigious long horn of the narwhale, which for a long period after hung in the castle at Windsor. An Irish author, averse to that Earl of Leicester on bended knees, did likewise present to her highness another horn, pertaining to a land beast of the unicorn nature. The narwhal has a very picturesque leopard-like look, being of a milk-white ground color, dotted with round and oblong spots of black. His oil is very superior, clear, and fine, but there is little of it, and he is seldom hunted. He is mostly found in the circumpolar seas. Book 2, Octavo, Chapter 4, Killer Of this whale little is precisely known to the Nantucketer, and nothing at all to the professed naturalist. From what I have seen of him at a distance, I should say that he was about the bigness of a grampus. He is very savage, a sort of Fiji fish. He sometimes takes the great folio whales by the lip and hangs there like a leech, till the mighty brute is worried to death. The killer is never hunted. I never heard of what sort of oil he has. Exception might be taken to the name bestowed upon this whale on the ground of its indistinctness for we are all killers on land and on sea, Bonapartes and sharks included. Book 2, Octavo, Chapter 4, Chapter 5, Thrasher. This gentleman is famous for his tail, which he uses for a funeral in thrashing his foes. He mounts the folio whale's back, and as he swims, he works his passage by flogging him, as some schoolmates get along in the world by a similar process. Still less is known of the thrasher than of the killer. Both are outlaws, even in the lawless seas. Thus ends Book 2, Octavo, and begins Book 3, Duodecimo. Duodecimos. These include the smaller whales, the Huzza porpoise, the Al two, the Algerine porpoise, three, the mealy-mouthed porpoise. To those who have not chanced specially to study the subject, it may possibly seem strange, 
that fishes not commonly exceeding four or five feet shall be marshaled among whales, a word which, in the popular sense, always conveys an idea of hugeness. But the creatures set down above as duodecimos are infallibly whales. By the terms of my definition of what a whale is, i.e. a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. Book 3, Duodecimo, Chapter 1, Huzza Porpoise. This is the common porpoise found almost all over the globe. The name is of my own bestowal, for there are more than one sort of porpoises, and something must be done to distinguish them. I call him thus because he always swims in hilarious shoals which upon the broad sea keep tossing themselves to heaven like caps in a fourth of July crowd. Their appearance is generally hailed with delight by the mariner. Full of fine spirits, they invariably come from the breezy billows to windward. They are the lads that always live before the wind. They are counted a lucky omen. If you yourself can withstand three cheers at beholding these vivacious fish, then heaven help you. The spirit of godly gamesomeness is not in you. A well-fed, plump huzzah porpoise will yield you one good gallon of good oil, but the fine and delicate fluid extracted from his jaws is exceedingly valuable. It is in request among jewelers and watchmakers. Sailors put it on their hoods. Porpoise meat is good eating, you know. It may never have occurred to you that a porpoise spouts. Indeed, his spout is so small that it is not very readily discernible. But the next time you have a chance, watch him and you will then see the great sperm himself in miniature. Book 3, Duodecimo, Chapter 2, Algerine Porpoise. A pirate, very savage. He is only found, I think, in the, in the Pacific. He is somewhat larger than the Huzza Porpoise, but much of the same general make. Provoke him and he will buckle to a shark. I have lowered for him many times, but never yet saw him captured. Book 3, Duodecimo, Chapter 3, Mealy-Mouthed Porpoise. The largest kind of porpoise, and only found in the Pacific so far as it is known. The only English name by which he has hitherto been designated is that of the fisher's right whale porpoise, from the circumstance that he is chiefly found in the vicinity of that folio. In shape, he differs in some degree from the Huzza porpoise, being of a less rotund and jolly girth. Indeed, he is of quite a neat and gentlemanlike figure. He has no fins on his back, most other porpoises have. He has a lovely tail and sentimental Indian eyes of a hazel hue, but his mealy mouth spoils all, though his entire back down to his side fins as of a deep sable, yet a boundary line distinct as the mark in a ship's hull, called the bright waist. That line streaks him from stern to stern with two separate colors, black above and white below. The white comprises part of his head and the whole of his mouth, which makes him look as if he had just escaped from a felonious visit to a meal bag a most mean and mealy aspect. His oil is much like that of the common porpoise. Beyond the duodecimo, this system does not proceed, inasmuch as the porpoise is the smallest of the whales. Above, you have all the leviathans of note, but there are a rabble of uncertain fugitive, half-fabulous whales, which as an American whaleman I know by reputation, but not personally. I shall enumerate them by their forecastle appellations, for possibly such a list may be valuable to future investigators, who may complete what I have here but begun. 
If any of the following whales shall be hereafter be caught and marked, then he can readily be incorporated into this system according to his folio, octavo, or duodecimo magnitude. The bottlenose whale, the junk whale, the pudding-headed whale, the cape whale, the leading whale, the canning whale, the scrag whale, the coppered whale, the elephant whale, the iceberg whale, the quag whale, the blue whale, etc. From Icelandic, Dutch, and Old English authorities, there might be quoted other lists of uncertain whales, blessed with all manner of uncouth names. But I omit them as altogether obsolete, and can hardly help suspecting them from mere sounds, full of leviathanism, but signifying nothing. Finally, it was stated at the outset that this system would not be here and at once perfected. You cannot but plainly see that I have kept my word, but I now leave my cytological system standing thus unfinished, even as the greatest cathedral of Cologne was left, with the crane still standing upon the top of the uncompleted tower, for small erections may be finished by their first architects, grand ones, true ones, ever leave the copestone to posterity. God, keep me from ever completing anything. This whole book is but a draft, nay, but the draft of a draft. O oh, time, strength, cash, and patience.